on World News Tonight. Ten stocks. Ukraine and Russia exit yet another round of discussions, not yet making any breakthroughs as diplomatic tensions rise. Both sides rush to make bolder moves in the conflict. Caught in chaos. Civilians hide from shelling and air raids as the two countries struggle to find common ground. Despite efforts to conquer and intensify, the world decries the worsening humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. Grim milestone. Global COVID deaths surpass a new mark. The world mourns for those lost in the pandemic, despite the countries are optimistic as cases are seen on the decline. Breathtaking skies. Sweden witnesses nature's most exquisite displays of lights in the night sky. Aurora Borealis illuminates amidst the stars. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with yet more grim updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. A member of the Ukrainian delegation said the third round of Russian-Ukraine peace talks concluded in Belarus's Brest Oblast without a substantial outcome, adding that intensive consultations will continue on issues including a ceasefire and security guarantees in the upcoming days. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Malsha Patiraja, who joins us now from Kursk in Russia. For more, Malsha. Ishanali. Ukrainian presidential advisor Mihailo Padalyak, who is also a member of the delegation, said in a video posted on Twitter that the fresh round of talks, which lasted for around three hours, failed to make a substantial progress conduct due to the situation. However, Padalyak said there are small positive results in improving the logistics of the humanitarian corridors, which will help ensure effective assistance to residents. The Russian side hopes the humanitarian corridors will start operations soon. And Vladimir Medinsky, the head of the Russian delegation, said Ukraine has made its promise on this. Medinsky said Russia didn't get what it expected of the breast talks with the Ukraine. Leonid Slutsky, the head of the International Affairs Committee of the State's Duma, said Russia wishes to evacuate people through humanitarian aid channels as soon as possible following negotiations. While informing that the fourth talks will take place in Belarus in the near future, Slutsi said Russia has no illusions about the outcomes. The Ukrainian delegation has left Brest by helicopter. The Russian government also decided on Monday to cancel the payment of the patent, patent fees to unfriendly countries. The list of the unfriendly countries and the territories approved earlier that the day includes those who had imposed or joined the sanctions against Russia after it started a military operation in Ukraine. The United States, European Union member states, United Kingdom, Ukraine and Japan are among those listed. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you, and that was Adha Dharana World News Pressure Correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. Russia has been relentless on the attacks in Kyiv, especially as the conflict moves further into the country. Civilians continue to get caught in the crossfire while shelling ruins even more infrastructure. Russian troops are now on Kiev's doorstep and they're trying to break in through a suburb called Irpin. And this slippery row of planks is the only way for civilians to get out. Civilians today were crossing in wheelchairs or carried out. But even as they escape, Russian troops keep firing on them. This disturbing video yesterday captured what Russia is unleashing on civilians fleeing its onslaught. In the background, you see people running down the sidewalk, leaving Irpin. And then this. A mortar strike. Ukrainian soldiers move in to help. But on that sidewalk, at least four people, three from one family, lie dead. Those who made it out today loaded onto waiting ambulances. Thank God for their salvation. I can't even express how I feel, she says. At the same time Russia has been shelling civilians, today it offered what it claimed were evacuation routes for them out of four Ukrainian cities. So-called humanitarian corridors rejected by Ukraine because virtually every path leads to hostile territory in Russia or its ally Belarus. Ukrainian President Zelensky has strongly criticized President Biden and the West for not placing sanctions on Russia sooner to try to prevent the invasion. 
In a speech today, Zelensky again pleaded for a ban on the sale of Russian oil. Meanwhile, a senior U.S. defense official tonight says nearly 100 percent of Russia's troops that were on the Ukrainian border are now inside the country, though they continue to meet Ukrainian resistance, even in areas Russia now controls. Ukrainians lying down in front of Russian vehicles, even riding on top of one, waving a Ukrainian flag. Back in Kiev today, the main children's hospital took the difficult decision to evacuate the most fragile patients. Those unable to walk were lifted onto buses. Victoria is leaving behind her husband. He's staying in Kiev to fight. From the bus, the children and their parents are loaded onto a train bound for Lviv, nine hours away. War has reduced Ukraine to this. A train full of sick kids evacuating as the Russians close in. Victoria does her best to keep her baby Mark calm as the train set off for the West for safer territory. But despite this, Kyiv rejected a Russian offer to allow Ukrainians to escape via humanitarian corridors, but only to Russia or Belarus. French President Emmanuel Macron called the offer hypocritical and criticized the cynicism exhibited by Moscow. From one town to the next, Ukrainian civilians continue to run away from Russian bombs, leaving their homes behind with just a few possessions. So far, efforts to create a humanitarian corridor have failed. Monday, the Kremlin announced that a ceasefire over six routes started at 10 a.m. Moscow time. Detailed information about the humanitarian corridors was brought to the attention of the Ukrainian side in advance, as well as to the UN, the OSCE and the Red Cross. Four of the six destinations proposed by Moscow are in Russian or Belarusian territory. Ukrainian officials called the offer an immoral stunt. This is an unacceptable option. We demand the Russian Federation to stop manipulating and betraying trust of world leaders like Emmanuel Macron, leaders of China, Turkey and India, and open routes which we specified. Moscow's ministry declared that the decision was a personal request from French President Emmanuel Macron, claims the Elysee denies. On the ground, civilians too are wary of the Kremlin's offers. As ceasefire talks continue between Ukrainians and Russians, families attempt to find shelter. The UN estimates that in just the past 10 days, more than 1.7 million people have managed to cross into neighboring countries making this the fastest-growing refugee crisis in Europe since the Second World War. With failing humanitarian efforts and an increased attack by Russia, the United States is moving even closer to considering a total sanction on Russian oil. However, it was speculated that allies of the United States through NATO will not have to give up the inflow. In a move to further punish Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, the United States is considering a ban on Russian oil imports without the participation of allies in Europe. Two people familiar with the matter told Monday. The White House is said to be negotiating with U.S. congressional leaders who are working on fast-tracking legislation. Though White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said there's no decision yet. Well, no decision has been made at this point uh, by the president about uh, an, uh, a ban an import, a ban on importing uh, oil from Russia. Uh, and those discussions are ongoing internally and also with our counterparts uh, and uh, partners uh, in Europe and around the world. President Joe Biden Monday tried to press his case in a video conference call with the leaders of France, Germany and the United Kingdom. But Germany, the biggest buyer of Russian crude oil, has so far rejected pressure for a ban. The United States, which has imposed a host of painful sanctions against the Russian economy, President Vladimir Putin and many Russian billionaires since the invasion began, has stopped short of targeting Russia's oil and gas, worried it could drive energy prices even higher. Oil prices have soared to levels not seen since 2008, and Americans are getting sticker shock at the pump. But some don't mind if it means condemning Russia. As far as I'm concerned, uh, we should uh, raise the gas price, I mean, uh, stop importing uh, well, from Russia, 
and put the hurt on them, it's going to make inflation go up even higher. But uh, we've got to do what we've got to do. Meanwhile, Axios reported that President Biden might make a trip to Saudi Arabia as the United States seeks to get Riyadh to increase energy production. A White House official didn't deny the report, but said it was premature speculation and that nothing was planned yet. Meanwhile, hundreds of Indian students are trapped in eastern Ukraine, holed up in universities for cover and even melting snow for drinking water as they're desperate for supplies. Let's cross over to our Delhi in the World News special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar, who joins us now from Delhi in India for more details. Gayatri. Yes, Shenali. India urged Ukraine and Russia to impose a ceasefire in the northeastern Ukrainian city of Sami to help evacuate hundreds of Indian students trapped there amid worsening conflict. A group of around 1,000 students who had fled northeastern Ukrainian Kharkov, where one Indian medical student was killed this week, were being moved by bus towards the country's western borders. Some 300 Indian students still remain in the heavily bombed city before the conflict flared. Indians made up around a quarter of the 76,000 foreign students in Ukraine, the largest number from any overseas country. More than 10,000 Indian nationals have already flown back to India with another 16 evacuation flights scheduled in the coming days. Students trapped in these areas plead that they may not die of conflict but rather starvation and thirst as water and food supplies dwindling fast, leaving them to rely on natural sources like snowfall. Prime Minister Modi has contacted Russian President Vladimir Putin and expressed deep concern for the students stranded in Sami. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adit Arunna World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar reporting from Delhi in India. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News tonight. Sydney is still under torrents of rain. Flood warnings stretch across Australia's east coast and tens of thousands of Sydney residents fled their homes as torrential rains again pummeled the country's largest city, flooding several large suburbs. Tens of thousands of Australians have fled their homes as flood warnings stretch across the country's east coast. Torrential rains have pummeled the country's largest city, Sydney, flooding the streets of several large suburbs. Nearly two dozen people have been reported dead since floods in Australia began late last month. Local authorities said Tuesday a 67-year-old woman and her 34-year-old son in western Sydney were found dead near an abandoned car in a stormwater canal. While Bureau of Meteorology forecaster Dean Naramore said more flooding was expected from Queensland to Victoria. Australia's eastern rivers were already near capacity, following record downpours in several parts of Queensland and New South Wales states over recent weeks. Those rains cut off entire towns, swept away farms and livestock, and shut down power for countless residents. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has ordered further emergency personnel to flood hit areas. Kenya has been chosen as the location for the $500 million vaccine production plant Moderna plans to build to further facilitate jab production. This could be the company's first ever mRNA plant in Africa. Moderna has picked Kenya as the location for its first mRNA vaccine factory in Africa and said it expects to invest $500 million US dollars. Last year, the American pharmaceuticals company revealed plans to build a facility on the continent with the aim of pumping out 500 million doses, including COVID-19 shots, every year. That announcement came amid growing pressure on Big Pharma to do more to manufacture vaccines in lower income countries. Rwanda, Senegal and South Africa had been touted as potential locations. But on Monday, Moderna said it had entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Kenyan government. The company said the facility would focus on drug substance manufacturing, but could also be expanded to include fill-slash-finish and packaging capabilities. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta said Kenya and the entire continent had been left behind in the early stages of the pandemic, not because of want, but because of lack. Moderna, he said, had come to fill that space. 
There have been several efforts in recent months to help the continent produce its own vaccines using the advanced mRNA technology. The World Health Organization last year set up a tech transfer hub in South Africa. And in February, the WHO-backed Afrigen Biologics said it had made its own version of Moderna's shot. BioNTech, which teamed up with Pfizer to make the West's most widely used COVID-19 vaccine, has also announced plans to begin work on its mRNA manufacturing facility in the African Union this year. The UN Security Council convened a closed-door meeting to address North Korea's latest missile launch, but fell short of adopting an official statement condemning the regime's violation of related resolutions. This coming as the US and its European allies on the Council failed to convince China and Russia to back a statement. The U.S. Security Council has failed to reach a substantive outcome in its latest meeting to address North Korea's ballistic missile activities. The U.S. and its European allies on the Council failed to convince China and Russia to back an official statement condemning the North's violations of existing resolutions. Following Monday's closed-door meeting, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. urged members of the Council to speak with one voice. But let us start with the basic premise that the Council has a responsibility to speak publicly about clear and repeated violations of Security Council resolutions. We call on all Council members to speak with one voice in condemning these dangerous and unlawful acts. The statement was backed by 10 other ambassadors, including countries not on the Security Council, such as Australia and Japan. Cho Hyun, Seoul's ambassador to the UN, also endorsed a statement saying the council must publicly address the North's launches, which are clear and repeated violations of UNSC resolutions. The diplomats also reaffirmed their commitment to engage diplomatically with the North. The meeting came some 48 hours after the North conducted its ninth weapons test of the year. Meanwhile, the U.S. nuclear watchdog has spotted signs of activity at North Korea's main Yongbyon nuclear complex, as well as at other facilities. The IAEA also detected ongoing indications of activity at the Kangsan uranium enrichment complex and at the Pyongsan uranium mine and concentration plant. The head of the agency said the continuation of North Korea's nuclear program is deeply regrettable, stressing it's a clear violation of U.N. resolutions. Sarah Week, the world's largest gathering of energy leaders, are now focusing on Europe as the concern continues to spread. The conflict in the area is predicted to result in a major slowing down of clean energy transition around the world. As the world's biggest gathering of energy industry leaders returns to Houston this week, the eyes of conference goers are on Europe. Attendees at the Sarah Week conference have been anxiously watching the events in Ukraine unfold as the economic fallout continues to spread. Global oil prices have reached levels not seen since 2008, while gas prices have also reached record highs, delivering a combined rise in energy costs that is slowing economic growth. Executives are weighing the need for more oil in the short term, with the pressure they face to pump less in the long term as the economy transitions away from fossil fuels. Ten days, we'll all be watching for any news that the West is about to ban imports of Russian oil. A new grim milestone has been reached as the official global COVID-19 death toll has reached 6 million. This comes just over two years since the pandemic first broke out, but experts believe the figure may be higher. The global death toll from COVID-19 has hit the 6 million mark. The figure compiled by Rodometer reached 6 million 10,000 as on Monday. The U.S. has the most deaths, followed by Brazil, India, Russia and Mexico. South Korea is 65th on the list, with over 9,000 deaths as of Monday. But experts point out the current death toll might be just the tip of the iceberg. That takes into account, okay, uh, undiagnosed deaths, deaths that happen at home, undercounting, underreporting because lack of testing, and that's all happening in the developing countries. South Africa has seen over 3.5 million cases and just over 99,500 deaths have been confirmed since the start of the pandemic. The low vaccination rate there has also played a role in the death toll. 
Experts note the crisis in Ukraine could bring up the death toll, with a large number of unvaccinated Ukrainian refugees are flowing into Eastern European countries like Poland and Hungary. While over 1.5 million Ukrainian refugees have fled over the past 10 days, those countries do provide them with vaccines for free but do not carry out infection tests. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Firefighters are going all out again to try and put out massive wildfires that started near South Korea's east coast last week. Two big fires are still raging in the nearby Uljin country as well as the city of the Gangwon. The French army said that its anti-jihadist force in Mali had killed Yahya, a senior leader of the Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Joadi, an Algerian, was killed overnight roughly 160 kilometers north of the Timbuktu in central Mali. Nearly 400 civilians have been killed in an attack in Afghanistan since the Taliban took over the country last year. According to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, of the 397 civilians killed in the country, more than 80% were in the hands of the Islamic State, as she underscored the scale of the insurgents faced by the new government. A blimp denouncing the high number of femicides in Mexico flew over the country's capital. The 50-meter-long blimp, seen flying in the morning, read 10 femicides per day and no victims is forgotten. The United Nations Human Rights Chief said more than 300 people have been killed in airstrikes in northern Ethiopia since November. Florida's top health official said that the state would recommend against the COVID-19 vaccine for healthy children, breaking with guidance from the United States Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with Sweden's night skies Im illuminated by the wonderful northern lights displays. Thank you for watching. Good night.